Well, I, I spoke at the 845 service this morning, and if you were not awake, it was rather foggy and all the way down. And Houston is one of those rare cities on the planet where you can drive 85 miles an hour in the fog and feel good about yourself. <laughs> and uh, uh, if that's not an act of faith, I don't know what is. And uh, the 845 service went fine and people were kind. And I went up to my office afterwards and I missed it in the message. It was, I was just off. It was, it wasn't bad, but as Jesus said to me in my office, it wasn't good either. And so I was thinking about what, what did I miss? And uh, I think this is part of it. it. Today's All Saints Day. And whatever is going on in our world, whatever is going on in our land, and there's a lot, there's a lot. It's All Saints Day. And a great thing to do for us today and if you're watching at home on the web or TV, I encourage you to do this with us. It's a great day to remember your and my saints. And, and I was thinking, I ask myself the question sometimes, what would the saints of my life say to me today? They said things to me in the past, and I, I certainly remember them, but what, what, what are the things that people who you love and who love you who are gone now well, what would they say to you today? And I found myself thinking about this, and of course you remember grandparents and great-grandparents, and I remember um, teachers of mine uh, who have now passed away. And I remember the people who just, for whatever reason, at the right point, at the, at the right time, told me what I needed to hear. And I, I just wonder what, if that conversation would, could continue, and through prayer, I think, to some degree it can, what would they say to us today? And I like to think that what they would say to us is rooted in the best of what we can be as, as God's people. And that they would say things to us like, love more, be humble, don't worry about so much, smile, don't drive 85 miles an hour through fog. You know, there'd be some practical things that they would say to us. But I think they would, they would call out of us, if you will, the servant nature of our calling in the sense that we are called not to be people of power and might, although some of us will play those roles. We are not called to be people of strength or of boasting, but as Christians, we are called to be people who serve. That's it. Serve God and serve each other, and we do so out of love. And that kind of command to us comes from no political office or uh, really somewhat guided by the scriptures, but I guess in my own experience, I find it's a matter of the Holy Spirit and the heart. And what the saints have the ability to do is speak to that place in us where the Holy Spirit and the heart come together in such a way that they call us to love God and love each other more. So I pray today that maybe maybe this was what I was missing at 845. I, I felt like at the 845 congregation, I should have given like some sort of coupon, like come back next time and we won't charge you, but, <laughs> but we don't charge to get in, so that's kind of that's pointless. And uh, um, maybe that's what I missed, is, is that a servant nature of a calling is just bedrock to who we are. It's bedrock to the saints, and it's even fundamental to our scripture, because no ruler does anything without a people with them who serve. And that's what Paul knows. And as we elect a political leader this season, uh, I voted yesterday. Uh, I hope you will vote as well. If you want to know who I voted for the day after the election, I would be delighted to share that with you. Um, but, but a leader can do nothing without a heart that is committed to serve and, and people with that leader who are also committed to the same. And Paul knew that. 
So to set that tone for us, not just today and All Saints Day, but we're recruiting for a thing called Stephen's Ministry, and we're what these are is a collection of people who feel called to serve the people in our congregation in a greater way through uh, times that can be uh, really unique uh, and challenging and tough. And to help advertise that, we put together a little video. One of our Stevens ministers was willing to share a little bit of her experience. And so I'd like for us to watch it. If you feel called to this ministry, fill out the card in your uh, bulletin and give it to the front desk or connection point as you go. But in a greater way, let's look at it thinking of our commitment to serve and especially what the saints would tell us matters. Take a look. Well, um, I have heard um, a lot about Stephen Ministry from the pulpit um, during, you know, Sundays and they would have uh, campaigns where they're asking people to, to participate and to, you know, to to volunteer to become a student minister. And uh, I sort of felt, felt a calling, but um, I resisted it for a long period of time. And then um, Hurricane Katrina happened, and uh, my mom came and, well, she usually would come to stay with me during a storm that came into the Gulf. She would just kind of pack up and come over to Houston and spend some time with me. This time it turned into 18 months. So I was getting worried about her because she was kind of isolating herself and I wasn't quite sure if I was enabling what was happening and what could I do. So I reached out and uh, asked for a student minister to, to help me figure out what was going on, how do I handle the situation. The great thing about student ministry is that the student minister doesn't really tell you what to do. They help you figure it out yourself. So they walk with you and they kind of help you explore your feelings and get a better understanding of yourself and the situation. And, and you know, and God provides the, the answers and the solutions. And um, once that happened, I figured, you know, I still was resisting the calling. And, and I thought, you know, maybe I really should it appears that other people feel that I have an ability that I'm just not recognizing and utilizing, um, you know, to the, to the fullest. And so I went through the training, and that's when you go through the training is, is when you realize that it's not my responsibility to fix someone else. It's to, to walk with them and to, to be with them as they struggle. And that's, I think, the most freeing thing is that I always felt this responsibility to fix and to mend. And what Stephen Ministry shows you is that you're there, um, but you're not there to do the healing. God does the healing. If you have a caring heart and you love people, you can become a Stephen Ministry. express your appreciation for that word being shared with us this morning. Thank you. It's a great story, and Stephen's ministers are people who, who really just feel called on a one-on-one -on -one basis to really help people get through uh, difficult times. And I, I just have to, to laugh sometimes at the, the intersection between just the most traditional of church ministries in the age in which we live, in that we had somebody in our, our community in Houston downtown that was needing a Stevens minister. They were going through some, some tough stuff, and they were not affiliated with any church. And so what they did is they got on Google and Googled Stevens Ministry Houston. Our church website popped up. They contacted us, and now they are in a partnership with a Stevens minister in our church. So God takes a very old idea, works it through Google, which I think is super cool, and then all of a sudden ministry happens. But that can happen here at the church. And so if you feel tugged to do that, or if, if you're kind of one of these people that feels like I'm not doing anything that really matters, maybe this is a place to change that. And sometimes I find that even, it surprises me, it shouldn't, but it does, that people who have the most important jobs and the most important roles and the, and, and the most 
vibrant families sometimes still feel there's something more, and often I find that feeling is associated with just the need to love and to serve in a selfless way. And if we do that, so much of our Christian calling is fulfilled. So the Apostle Paul writes to us in this political season, and I'll be honest with you, I've been arguing with, with Paul all week. I've, I've found the conversation a little one-sided and that he hasn't exactly spoken back yet. But I have trouble with this because we're I voted on I voted on Saturday and I'll be honest, I have a tough time thinking that my candidate is the messenger of God. Maybe I'm unique in this. But I'll be forthcoming. I have a hard time with that. So when Paul says let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. I can, I'm in. God is God. And regardless of how the election turns out, God will be God. Jesus is still going to be Jesus. The kingdom is still going to be built. The Holy Spirit will still be the Holy Spirit. And all of this does not matter one whit on who the President of the United States is. Is that true? It's true. So, yes, we can give God a hand. <laughs> but Paul goes on. The authorities that God, consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. Hmm. Hmm. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. I don't like that part as much. Well, I just think back. I think back. One of the people I first read when I was coming to faith, actually, I, I don't even think I was baptized yet. Somebody handed me, we talk about saints, a, a professor in my college knew that I was kind of asking some, some religious questions but hadn't come to faith. So he handed me a book. It was Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Cost of Discipleship. Now, if you are not a Christian and you are listening to this, I greatly do not recommend you start with Dietrich Bonhoeffer. It's a bit of a heady read. The essence of his message, though, is this. It's like the church has to demand justice. And when political authority does wrong, the church has got to be a strong voice against it. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer who was living in Hitler's Nazi Germany, held the church accountable and said the church was guilty of going along with the horror that Nazi Germany brought upon the earth because it didn't speak up and it didn't demand the gospel and it didn't say this is wrong and this is evil and this is destructive. This is not what Jesus had in mind. The church went along. And so he had a hard time understanding this text given the reality of his day. Closer to home, we might think about the civil rights movement and all that that was rooted in the church and how it went against the political authority of the day. You know, one of the things that I've had to learn as an adult is that when, when you hear our candidates talk about being law and order this or law and order that, at times in our nation's history, your perception of that depends on kind of what group you're in, right? And if the law and the order's coming at you, that's a whole different perspective than if you're on the other side of the line. And we gotta realize that we have a voice in that in the church, and so when we see our politics going wrong, the worst thing we can do is be silent. We gotta say something. We gotta show folks what we're about. And so when Paul says this, I look and say, are you so sure? Because let me tell you, when it gets ugly, it can get really ugly. And the church has got to say a word. We've got to say a word. My wife and I, we watched the Oprah Winfrey movie, um, Selma, recently. You know, my wife has this real job where she works in the hood. She teaches in a tough neighborhood and charter schools. And I have a one-day-a-week job, so... <laughs> I have a lot more time to go to the movies and <laughs> hang out and, and preach mediocre sermons at 8.45 in the morning. 
But we watched Selma, and it's a movie, and it's, it's an interpretation of things. I know, don't, don't want to get too factual with it. But one of the things the movie does a nice job with is talking about the clash between the values of the church, which Dr. King represented, and, and the values of our politicians who struggled, if, if they were in the struggle, to bring justice on the earth. And there's some very powerful scenes, I'd recommend you watch it, between Dr. King and LBJ in the Oval Office about, about what the right thing to do was. And here the President of the United States is, is a great man of power. He has the ability to do so much, but sometimes when faced with the obvious right thing to do, it's, very, it's a very difficult political step to take. And Selma does a great job of showing it. I recommend you, you take a look. But it's just an example of how Paul's words, if we, if we take them too literally, I think can put our nation in a bad place. And if we are to watch our government and it, is, it, goes, it does something that is amiss, we as the church have to say so. And in fact, I would say the circus that our politics is now is largely because the church has been so silent. And if we step up and we start demanding the virtues which our scripture asks of us, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, kindness, goodness, mercy, self-control, is that all of them? I think it is. If we start demanding those of ourselves, of our churches, of our nation, of our government, of our leaders, and say, these are the values we hold dear, the conversation will change. We have to do that. Now, I think that Paul would be on board with this. If you take Romans 13 on down the page, you will see that he kind of does an interesting, he has an interesting word. He said, all laws, this is what I found the most interesting, all laws are fulfilled by love. In other words, politicians can make decrees and there can be laws to do this and that, but the truth is all good laws, all moral laws, all the, the obligations that a government can put upon us, all are fulfilled if we love our neighbor to the degree which we are called. In other words, if we love each other, we don't need all these rules. And I think he's right. So Paul, when he says this, I think he's got two assumptions which are at work. One is the sovereignty of God, and he's absolutely right about that. God is still God no matter how elections turn out or what leaders think they do. Leaders come and go, as the scripture tells us. You know, when Israel starts off, they're under Pharaoh. They have their own judges and leaders and prophets. There are kingdoms that come and go. There are emperors, and in Paul's day, there are Caesars who are now gone. All these rulers will change, but the thing that fulfills all laws and almost makes politics unnecessary is when we love each other to the degree that Jesus loved us. When we fulfill that command in our life, the need for rules goes away. And it's true in matters large and small. Our daughter is, is home from college, which usually means three things. She's out of money. She has a massive amount of laundry, right? Or she missed us, or all three. And so she was home this weekend, and, and so she said, well, one of, the, one of my areas of responsibility of dad is, is the cars, right? As, as the fleet of cars that we have, you know, I am, I'm the one who's kind of like responsible for saying, how's, how's the fleet? So she comes in the driveway, and I hug her, and she talks about college this and college that. And so anyway, and then we get down to business. Laundry, food, money, car. I said, how's the car? And she goes, well, one of my tires was kind of low, but she said, I aired it up all by myself. And I went, there you go. Adultness is coming your way. And I said, did you check the other three? And then there was this long silence which I've learned in daughter speak means no. <laughs> so I said, I'll go out and check them. I'm the dad, that's my job. And, but I gotta tell you, I was, I honestly, as I was doing it, here is my genuine thought. It's like, I don't have a lot of chances to serve her as her dad much anymore. It's like, she's an adult, she's getting trained to be a nurse, she's a few months from a job, God willing. And so she's, she's more and more doing her thing. She's taking care of herself. And that's exactly what we want her to do, right? But one of the things it is, for me at least, is I miss getting to be needed. 
And so I pull out our air compressor from the garage and I run the extension cord to her car and I'm checking the tire pressure and three tires and the fourth just to make sure she did it right. And I'm going through this and it's like, I've really missed this. I have. I've missed it. And I, I don't miss it because it's like I missed the rule of, you know, when you become a parent, it's like you should take good care of your kids, which is a true rule. I miss it because I love her, right? And that makes all the difference. And I absolutely had a great time checking tire pressure. If, if you would like for me to check yours after the service, I'm, I am ready to serve. And we'll see if I love you as much as I love her. I doubt it, but we'll try. But the state of the heart makes all the difference when we are following rules. And the Apostle Paul echoed Jesus entirely when, when he said that the law is fulfilled by love. We can't go through life just doing things because we're told to. And we can't keep looking to political leaders to give us more rules to follow. They're necessary to some degree, but the only way you and I are going to live a meaningful life and the only way you and I are going to be happy and the only way you and I are going to see the kingdom of God being built is if we learn to love each other to the degree which Jesus loved us. It's the fundamental assumption behind every God-given command. And so we do such a mistake if we get to the rule and stop and say, that's the law, that's the command, that's the rule that God gives us. No, we are called to break through that and see the love behind the reason. And once we do, we've arrived. As the Apostle Paul would later say, he says, at first we, you know, we look through a mirror darkly because we can't quite see. I don't know if you remember old-fashioned mirrors, but you could used to, you get real close to them and you could see through. He said, but then there comes a time where the veil or the mirror is taken away and we can see things as they truly are. What he was saying is, that when we see through the reason behind a rule or a law and we see the genuine raw power of the love of God, then we understand the why to what God does, what God does, and we also see who we are called to be. It's such an imperative that we break through the rule given facade, the legalism, the commands, all of them are important, but we have to see the love that is behind. And our politicians and our leaders, I think Paul would say, have the rule in such a way that they also lead us to love. It's the only force there is. The other day, I guess uh, Friday, I was, uh, my wife and I, actually our daughter too, we were, we were out at a West Chase, for, or West Chase campus for the, the pumpkin patch thing that, that, that we do out there. And, and, uh, and so we, uh, we went down and my wife insisted we decorate our Jeep, and so I took the top off the Jeep, and we had these really horrible-looking pumpkin lights strapped all around it, and I, I don't know what Jeeps in hell look like, but I'm thinking they look pretty close to that. <laughs> anyway, we were down there, and, and, and we were in the trunk or treat section and, and, and giving kids candy as they came by. And there were many takeaways from, from the evening. Uh, one was, I got roped into being a judge for a kid's costume contest. I will never, as senior pastor, make that mistake again. You get to tell a whole bunch of children that they're not your favorite. It's not a politically desirable situation to be in. Just because it's funny, I'll tell you the rest of the story. There were three categories of which I had to help pick the winner. And, in the first group, there was a little girl dressed as a donut box. How could I vote against a donut? I love donuts, so she won. In the, in the second group, there was a mom dressed up as a burning building, and her little boy was, had a cardboard fire truck with a fire hat, which I thought was awesome, so they won. And then uh, in the third group, there were actually two devils, which I theologically could not go there. That's just, you know, <laughs> Satan cannot win in any church contest. <laughs> as a note to you parents, don't send your child dressed as the devil to church. That's just, <laughs> it just makes things a lot easier for us if I can make that selfish request. 
But there was a girl dressed as an angel, so, so we picked her. And I was looking at the contestants that had won this, and I thought, this summarizes my life. I've got donuts, a building on fire, and an angel, and my life has been a combination <laughs> of all three. You know, there we go. But I'm, I'm going through the crowd, and there were a lot of people there. In fact, there were so many people, I was surprised. You know, preachers always round up, so I'm sure there were like 250,000 people there or something, but <laughs> there were a lot of people there, and there were, a lot of, there were a lot of languages spoken, some of which I knew, some of which I did not. There were a lot, it was Noah's Ark, as far as the kind of folks, there was two of every kind. And, and so I'm looking at that, and I'm thinking about our church, First Mothers Houston, and so I, just, I asked God, genuinely, how are we going to reach these people? How many of them do I think really know Jesus beyond the name? And I think the vast majority do not. And the ones that do know things about Jesus, I'm really not sure, and I just find this in the world today, what people think they know about Jesus, I find is just wildly inaccurate. So it's a double problem. But I'm, I'm looking at these, kids, or these families, and I'm thinking, well, where do we start with them? And I'm watching them walk, and these are moms and dads and kids and Halloween and all, all this stuff. And, and I'm looking, it's like, well, these, these parents love their kids. That's obvious. I could see them. You did this too if you're an empty nester like we are. And, you know, when you're taking your kids down the street for Halloween, the kids look great and the parents look terrible. They're exhausted. They're worn out. They're being drugged through this again. But the kids look great. These these folks I was looking at love their kids. And the other thing, and this was just kind of when you look at the diversity of, of the neighborhoods over there, it's tremendous. The other, the other sense you got just running through the crowd was the people here want to belong. They love their kids, and they want a place to belong. They want a place to call home. And this is Houston, is real new. And I just got to thinking, what would it look like if First Methodist Houston found a way, prayed for a way, sought a way to so love people, all kinds, that they found home here? And through our witness and our love and through our care and through our prayer and through our being the Stevens minister for a family in time of need, could we be the force that reaches out to these folks and say, get to know the loving man we call Jesus Christ and the loving God he is from and how we are called to love and serve in his name and the life that's possible. Would you join us? I think for so many, the answer will be yes because I saw the love they have for the kids and I saw the love that they have for each other and I saw they're wanting to belong and if we could as the church find a way to reach what a church we could be. And I'm just gonna ask you to pray about that with me because one thing I will say that Romans 13 I think does te teach us is, is that leaders can only do so much. It's true for politicians and it's true for pastors. Leaders can only do so much. But if we have a heart that loves God and loves each other, if we have a heart that wants to grow, if we have a heart that seeks to serve and genuinely loves everybody that we meet, then we have a chance of putting ourselves in the most powerful force on the planet, and that is the spirit-filled, loving place that Jesus Christ calls his church. Pray with me.